Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I forgot my readers as I came to the studio and I have my fancy dancy, normal everyday glasses on. But you know how God works. And he reminds me that I can still see. Uh, I, I, I've got a perfect vision of the camera, of the lights, of my countdown clock. I have a perfect vision of everything in the room. I'm a little foggy on things up close because these are bifocals. And though I'm used to them, I usually just switch to my readers when I get to the office. And when I'm at home, I switch to another set of readers because I like to put my glasses up on my head. And these glasses I can't put up on my head because of the um, nose pads or the nose guards. And so my readers don't have them, so I can just flip them up on my head, take them back down. But here's what God spoke to my heart. He will bring into focus anything that's not. Whether we're wearing glasses of doubt, glasses of fear, glasses of perception and discernment, glasses of unknowing, he will always, through the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, teach us, focus us, show us what we need to see. And if something is out of focus, you just simply ask him to let you see clearly that is a prayer that he will answer all the time. Lord, let me see clearly what the purpose is. Let me see clearly what you want me to learn here. Let me see clearly the next step I'm supposed to take. Oh, he may not show you clearly where you're supposed to be in five years, but I know that he'll tell you where you need to be in the next five minutes or the next hour, the next day, the next week, because God is a God of focus. And that's just that quick message that he spoke to my heart today as I was sitting here just praying before the cameras start to roll. He will bring into focus anything that's unclear. Amen. Amen and amen. So I have a message today called prison ministry. But wait, it's not what you think. It's not about someone who goes to prison for ministry. It's not about going to Bible study in prison. It's God's ministry to us who are prisoners. Now, immediately when I say we're prisoners of something, uh, something will probably come to mind. You're a prisoner of your own past, a prisoner of your failings, a prisoner of doubt, a prisoner of fear, a prisoner of broken relationships. You're prisoners. Some are prisoners trapped in their own homes. They're, they're afraid to go out. Some are afraid of the pandemic, and you're a prisoner of the pandemic, right? But I, like Paul, am a prisoner of Christ. And that's the ministry that he has for me. Now, let, let me show you. This is so exciting to me. When God re reveals something fresh and new, and that's what he has done. So let me read, of course, a definitive verse. And it is Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1. <laughs> I had to shift my glasses up. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, I don't think that he was thrilled at this point with being a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. That's not the way that it reads. And if you read the, the understanding of it, you'll get it. And so this is an interesting way for Paul to refer to himself. He didn't say an apostle of Jesus Christ or an elder or a Pharisee, but a prisoner of Christ. This is how he introduces himself. 
I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. Okay. Now the word prisoner, simple, means to be bound or captive by someone. To be held captive or to be bound by someone. By definition, a prisoner has no rights and no privileges other than those granted to him by his captor, right? He is totally dependent on his captor for his very existence. Food, water, and sustenance, the ability to, to sleep, everything was at the control of the one who held you captive. So if Paul is a prisoner of Jesus Christ, what he is saying is, I have submitted myself to Jesus to be totally dependent on my captor for everything I might possibly need. Now, here's the way the story goes, though. And we kind of have to flip to the book of Acts for you to understand how Ephesians 4 comes about. Uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3. And so here's Acts chapter 22, verses 17 and 18. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and I saw the Lord speaking. I love that. God did not just speak to Paul so he heard him. He showed up so Paul could see him talking. Not just hear him talking, but hear him speaking. Quick, the Lord said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. What was Paul's response to Jesus telling him to go? Next two verses. Chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. Lord, I replied, those men that I went from, those men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Really? Did Paul just tell Jesus he was wrong? Yeah, basically. You see, that's how we get sometimes when we're too focused on what we think we should be doing for God. We need to listen to what the Spirit is speaking. So here's the Lord's response to Paul. God said, go. Paul said, no. God said, go. Listen, chapter, Acts chapter 22, verse 21. Then the Lord said to me, go, and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. You see, this is how Paul viewed his life. He believed that he was supposed to speak to the Jews. And if it were up to Paul, he wanted to stay and speak in the synagogue, try to persuade the Jews. He even told Jesus, listen, these guys were around when I was killing believers, so they kind of respect me for what I was doing. Except he became one of them that he was martyring and killing. He became a believer. And God said to Paul, Paul, these men they're not going to receive what you say. And so I'm sending you to where you can be uh, beneficial to me the most. I'm sending you away to the Gentiles. Paul didn't like that. So when we pick it up in Ephesians chapter 3, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ for the sake of Jesus Christ, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. Arr. <laughs> you can see him. Right? What Paul was saying is, I became a prisoner because this was not my will, but the will of God. And I wanted to go to the synagogues and to the Jews. 
But now for the sake of you Gentiles, I have been sent far away. I can almost see his head snap and that err come out of him. For the sake of you Gentiles. But boy, did God know and have that perfect plan. Because Paul did that very thing. And he changed the whole face of Asia Minor because he was obedient to go as a prisoner. Remember, he was at the behesting of his captor. And he said, Jesus Christ has taken me prisoner and he put me in a place where I don't want to go, but I'm going to do it because, well, I love him, right? Okay. And sometimes I have to remember that I choose to be God's prisoner. Ouch. I choose to be God's prisoner. I bow my knee to his desire for my life as opposed to mine. And this is how Paul viewed himself. He saw no life other than the calling of God on him. Let me read you Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ready? As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. What's he talking about? Well, I believe Paul is saying we've all been called to be prisoners of the Lord. As a prisoner for the Lord, he goes, and then I urge you to live as a prisoner of the Lord. What does that mean to be a prisoner of the Lord? Just that very thing. We submit our will to his. We submit our desires to his. We go where he tells us to go. We do what he asks us to do. And we trust him that... Okay, so being in jail is not the best thing. Being a prisoner is not the greatest thought. But I think that's what Paul's trying to teach us, is that being a prisoner of Christ may not be the choice of everyone. It's the call of everyone. But it may not be the choice of everyone. As a prisoner of Christ... He urged others to live a life worthy of that calling. He's urging us right now, today, in 2023, to live a life worthy, deserving of our high calling in Christ as a prisoner for him. Now, the Spirit gives us an amazing insight from the prison experience of Joseph Way back in the Old Testament, remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph. <clears throat> we all know the story of Joseph. You know, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was accused unjustly and thrown into prison. And then he became the second most powerful man in all of the land, right? And he saved his very family from famine. So here's a picture, and I want you to hear the words with an open heart. All right. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. The king's prisoners. I'm a prisoner of the king. Here's what happens. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. He was in the place of the king's prisoners. And the Lord, the king, was with him. You see, Jesus never says, I'm just going to throw you into prison and make you a prisoner of me and then let you go on your own. No. He said, if you're my prisoner, I'm going to put you in a place where the king's prisoners are. And I'm going to be there with you the whole time. That's 
this crazy, amazing scripture from Joseph. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Right? That Jesus never leaves us, forsakes us. He said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one who comes alongside of us. It's where we get our word paramedic from, one who comes alongside to aid us. Well, that's the Holy Spirit, our paraclete. They are with us all the time. God the Father is the Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is there. It's out of Ezekiel. Jehovah Shema, the Lord. Who's there? Where's that? Wherever you need him, the Lord is there with you. And so when we serve as a prisoner of Christ, we are guaranteed that he will be with us. But wait, what's the prison diet? Oh, now, okay, so today prison diets may not be the same as it was in the past but if you ask anyone who was familiar with stories of the past, ancient past, uh, distant past, they would say two words, bread and water. That's all you get, bread and water. I know my mom would jokingly threaten to just serve us bread and water. What's for dinner? Bread and water, she'd say. Bread and water. Well, what about something? No, bread and water. That's all we're getting tonight is bread and water. And one night she actually put it on the table, just a loaf of bread, some butter, and some water. Now, for me, that's a perfect meal. I'm a bread girl. I would rather eat bread and butter than dessert. You can have the cheesecake and the pastries. You can have that all. Just hand me a French baguette and some butter, and I'm a happy camper, right? And so bread and water, prison diet, bread and water. Oh, wait, bread and water. John 6, 35. <laughs> Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. My prison diet as a prisoner of Christ is Jesus, the bread himself. He is the bread of life. Bread and water. Bread and water. John 4, verses 10 through 14. Jesus answered and said to her, if you, this is the woman at the well, okay. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, and you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain or a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The prison diet of bread and water is none other than Jesus Christ himself. 
I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. I, Paul, was a prisoner and I was in the king's prison where the king's prisoners go. But the Lord was with me. And while I was there, I had a steady diet of the living water and the living bread. When we're a prisoner of Christ, we are given the choicest foods we could ever, ever think to enjoy. The very bread of life, the living water that springs up as life within me. This is what we get when we become a prisoner of Jesus. And this is what Paul was saying to us. I, Paul, I'm a prisoner. Why? I wanted to go. I wanted to stay where I could minister and preach in the synagogues. God said, no, you got to go. And Paul said, now I've become a prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles, because that's where God has sent me, far away from where I wanted to be. But I became a prisoner willingly for you Gentiles because my love for God constrained me and compelled me to become a prisoner, one who is completely submitted to a captor, one who trusts the captor for everything, one who must depend on the captor for anything and everything. So I, Paul, have willingly laid down my life to become a prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles. But I was in the king's prison, a place where king's prisoners are, and the Lord was with me. And while I was there, I was given the spiritual bread, the living bread, and the spiritual water. Oh, yes, we need normal bread and normal water. But Paul and John and Peter and James all knew of this special spiritual food. In fact, Jesus was ministering and the, the disciples had gone away and come back and they had come with food and they said, you need to eat. And Jesus said, listen, I have food that you don't understand. Doing the will of my father is all the food I could ever need. And then Paul says, I, a prisoner, urge you to become a prisoner for the sake of someone. Who has God called you to be a prisoner for? Who has God called you to lay down your life for? Might be your family, might be a Sunday school class, might be your church, might be, I don't know. But God has called you to a purpose to stop saying, well, I don't want to do that, or I refuse to do that, or I can't do that, and say, Lord, Wherever you want to send me, I'll go. For the sake of whoever you want to send me to, I'll go to Walmart. I'll just minister in Walmart. I'll just go see who I know and pray for them or ask them how I can pray for them. I might even see a stranger in need. When I'm in a restaurant, I, I know that you don't know this and you might know that you've heard me say that whenever I am praying over a meal, I will always say, God, alert our spirits to any need in this restaurant that we might be your hands and your feet and that we could step in and take care of that situation. And then I constantly look around to see if God has alerted my spirit to someone or something in that restaurant. A lot of times, nothing is needful. I don't have to do a thing. But there have been times where God has said, you need to pay for that meal. You need to pay for that person. You need to go to that person and ask them how you can pray for them. That's all God's asking us to do, is to stop saying, I can't, I won't. How could I possibly? 
I'd be like Paul. And Paul said, yeah, I want to stay. But if you bid me to go, Lord, I'll go. And boy, did he change the face of the world. He did. He brought so many into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he sent others to the Jews. Other disciples went to the Jews. Because God said, well, I, I'm sending you to the Jews first, to the disciples, and then to the Gentiles. Oh, gosh. To be a prisoner, that's prison ministry, right? That's God's prison ministry toward us. Amen. If you do not know this great Savior, Jesus Christ, will you please allow us the great honor and privilege of leading you to him, helping you find your way to the sweetest relationship you could have. It's a love unspeakable, immeasurable, incalculable. It is superior to any love you could ever find on this earth. And he's willing to freely give it to you to forgive your sins, to wipe out the debt against you in the spiritual realm because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus offers a way out of that. And we want to lead you to him. We want to pray with you. So if you call us at the office, get online, and let us help you find him. Because he is painting a beautiful picture. Your life with his one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.